Um, I think many of you may have heard of Hans Rosling before. He is the, uh, the Swedish uh, scholar who just passed away, in fact, but he's famous for the, his beautiful interactive graphs and kind of changing the way we see the world. And one of the things he did brilliantly, I thought, was to visually demonstrate to all of us that the way we think of the world, developing country, developed country, is fundamentally wrong. That that's an old construct from decades and decades ago. It doesn't apply to today's world. But it's interesting, even in the global development world that I work in, uh, it's hard to get rid of that mental construct. When, once we get an idea, the inertia, the framework, the inertia around that framework, that mental framework is, is tough to, uh, to change. And I think it's a similar situation with the idea of prosperity and growth. We all know GDP. It's something we've learned since we were kids. We've studied this. GDP is the way we typically measure progress in the world. But as a measure of today's world, it's really inadequate. And it leads potentially to some mistakes in policy making if we focus on GDP as a decision making tool. So what I want you to get out of this session in part is at the end of the session, hopefully you will walk away saying in the same way that it's no longer developed and developing countries that, that are the framework for our planet, that it's not just GDP anymore, it's uh, IDI. Inclusive Development Index, which we will talk about in a moment. So to join me in this discussion about what Latin America can do to make its economic growth more inclusive, we've got two uh, ideally positioned people. Richard Simons, who is, of course, the head of the Center for the Global Agenda here at the World Economic Forum. He's also a member of the managing board of the forum um, and has long experience on Capitol Hill and in the White House uh, working on these kinds of issues. So thank you for, for joining us. And Annabel Gonzalez, who was the Minister of Trade uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, led the, her country's competitiveness council and is now at the World Bank where she leads the uh, trade and competitiveness work. She's the senior director of that global practice. So thank you both for being here for this discussion. Uh, Rick, can I start with you? I'd like to just get a sense first of what, what is IDI, this acronym I've thrown out, and why does it matter when we think about inclusiveness? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Raj, for, for moderating and setting up very nicely the discussion uh, today. Uh, we, uh, for some time, have been hearing in our various meeting platforms and with our partners and others an increasing interest in trying to uh, frame a better, a more balanced growth model, an inclusive growth and development. There's effectively, I think, a, a consensus around that as a direction. But uh, there is much less consensus about exactly what the practical aspects of that. What, how do you actually do that, if you will? But, uh, you know, from, uh, to your point, from low-income countries to middle-income countries to advanced countries, there is virtual agreement that we need to adapt our mental map and the way we conduct economic policy and how we think about economic growth so that it produces uh, a much broader social benefit, if you will. And that you can see that yearning you can see reflected in the ballot box in various kinds of countries, including my own uh, most recently, uh, and sometimes on the street. So this is one of the critical issues of our time, if you will. So the forum is is not an academic academic institution. It's very much operating in the very in the applied in the practical world, and it has. Well, we're an international organization for public-private cooperation, so we, we're really a multi-stakeholder uh, body, but we do have something special, which is the private sector at the core of the organization as members and partners. So we took, if you will, a very practical, almost, uh, if you could call it this business-like approach to thinking through, almost like a business would, all right, if we need to have a new strategy, if you will, well, uh, what's, what works? Mm -hmm. can, what we can, can we observe from existing practice that works? And um, wh who's conducting the best practice? Can we get some data here, essentially, to benchmark against the success models that are occurring? And then out of that, can we construct the outlines of patterns of what then might inform a strategy? So the inclusive de development index that you're talking about is one element of an outcome of that whole thought process. Mm -hmm which uh, in, an, in a nutshell, uh, what we have done is to identify from uh, historical experience and research uh, what seems to work or what has worked for countries that have experienced both strong growth on the one hand and reasonably high equity, social equity at the same time. Mm -hmm. And out of that collective experience, if you will, we, we concluded uh, the following, and I'll try to work uh, rather quickly through this. One is that 
uh, very fundamentally, uh, the bottom line measure by which a society evaluates the economic performance of its leadership is not growth, per se, uh, but rather it is sustained and broad-based progress in living standards living standards. And living standards encompasses several things. One is income. Another one is opportunity or employment possibilities. Third is economic security. And fourth is quality of life. And so uh, you can think about economic growth as the top line measure of a country's economic success. But the bottom line, and business people will, I think will understand this analogy here, the bottom line is in fact the extent to which meeting living standards progress in a sustained fashion over time. And so we, we start with, if you will, it's a new way of thinking, a mental map. You, you kind of were articulating, we need, we need different mental maps. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there, that begins with having an understanding of what is the anchor here. What, what's the North Star? And I think, uh, let me pause here on that, and then maybe a little bit later in the conversation I'll go into the different elements of uh, what we found as to what works best and, and how you can operationalize that into a framework. Very good. Thank you. And, and you made me think of an example I heard yesterday here at this forum. Uh, Simone Gavidia was from the Ministry of Planning in Colombia, said that, for example, the way they're looking at their own development strategy is there could be a person who is technically above the poverty line, $2.50 a day, I think is the World Bank's line for, right. for the region, technically above the poverty line on income, but might not have a bathroom, might not have sanitation or running water. What is that person's quality of life? And we need to think more broadly of that individual and how how they are living. So, to, to you, Annabelle, you know, at the World Bank, you've got a team of 500 people working here in the region and elsewhere, but meeting with governments like in Colombia, like here in Argentina. Uh, what kind of advice are you giving them to take what Rick has laid out as the map and actually implement that on the ground? Well, let me maybe start by saying that, uh, as, uh, as, as you know, uh, the World Bank Group has uh, two key objectives. One is uh, eradicating poverty by the year 2030, and the second one is uh, boosting shared prosperity. Uh, so from our perspective, uh, you know, when we when we look at a partner as uh, as the World Economic Forum and this uh, inclusive uh, development index, I think it's a uh, it's a very important uh, instrument to you know help us think about our own goals uh, and how do we go about achieving uh, those goals. And one very important uh, point is the consistency across the different areas of policies, uh, because it's not only about promoting growth, which is as Rick was saying, mm -hmm. uh, very important. But it's also having in place a number of policies that will help actually uh, the most people to benefit uh, from that growth. We have seen, and we saw it in uh, in recent years, uh, a number of countries that have uh, high growth rates that not that's not necessarily translate into uh, well-being uh, for the population. So, if you take, for instance, an area like uh, trade, uh, one of the areas in which we work with a number of countries here in the region, um, we see that trade can be a powerful driver of growth. Uh, but how to make that growth uh, benefit uh, all, you need to think about other policies that are um, as important as your trade policies. For instance, uh, you need to, ha you need to uh, make sure that your uh, population has the skill set to be able to take advantage of the growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. You need to have in place social safety net nets uh, to mitigate uh, the cost that may be associated with trade. You need to have broader competitiveness frameworks uh, that will continue to foster sort of like this virtuous relationship between growth and opportunity uh, for um, for the members of your of your society. So uh, this this points about. Um, uh, greater consistency across policies is one that comes, I think, very clearly from looking at an index mm -hmm. uh, like this one, because at the end, it's not just one policy that can drive uh, those results. It's a, you know, consistency, coordination, prioritization uh, of these different policies. I think as Rick was saying earlier, the moment is important for us now on this. We've been talking about inclusive growth for a long time, but the, the trade conversation of no trade or trade is not really the right conversation, as you're saying. It's about the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess getting to that point, I wonder if, if, Rick, you can give us some insight into the demand for this. You're, you're talking to corporations who are thinking about how can they participate. You're talking to, to government leaders, heads of state. 
what, what at the country level, and particularly thinking about this region, what is the demand for changing the way that they, they develop their own growth strategies? I think the demand is enormous. Some of that demand is revealed because you've got governments really searching for new strategies under the, the, the hot glare of the, uh, you know, political attention in their countries. In other, in other domains, maybe it's not as explicit demand, but there's, there's, I think, a recognition that the model needs some updating, when I say the model, the economic model. Let, let me make a, a, a point or two building on uh, Annabelle's uh, comments. Uh, indeed, what she said is extremely important that it's not, there's no silver bullet, if I can uh, articulate mm -hmm. it in that way. And what we've done here, looking at experience, is identified 15 different areas of structural policy incentives and institutional strength, particularly institutional strength, mm -hmm. that matter for finding the win-win between the rate of growth on the one hand and the uh, extent to which the population as a whole participates in the process of growth, employment on the one hand, and receives uh, full benefit from growth, that is to say uh, income, security, quality of life, and the rest. So the, these are, as, as Annabelle is saying, these are 15 distinct dimensions which we think operate as an ecosystem. And you have to think about inclusive growth not as a, okay, there's, a, you know, you get your trade policy right here or mm -hmm. macro there and you're pretty much done. You got to look at a whole range of structural areas of policy and see how well that's functioning or not functioning as a system. If it's, in some countries, it functions in a virtuous circle where growth and inclusion have a, have a positive feedback loop and feed each other. In other cases where the system is deteriorated or is not functioning properly, you've got a vicious cycle mm -hmm. where you've got, uh, declining domestic demand, weak, you know, weak, weak domestic impetus for growth on the one hand, and weak progress or stagnation in living standards on, or on the other. And I like to think of this, this framework of these 15 areas as effectively the implicit income distribution system underpinning modern market economies. Mm -hmm. Or to be a little bit more precise about it, this is the mechanism by which living standards are diffused ar across society stemming from progress from growth, right? And unless, I mean, for years, talk about the mental map for mm -hmm. e economic policy, for, for a generation or so, we have uh, economists and policymakers had a mental map where we focused uh, almost exclusively, uh, I would say, on getting your macroeconomic policy right, mm -hmm. prudent fiscal and monetary policy on the one hand, openness because it's really important for getting your market signals correct, you know, and uh, trade embodies technology and keeps you competitive with where the frontier is moving uh, generally. Uh, and you got to, in your domestic markets, you also have to make sure that market signals, signals are functioning property, properly, uh, flexibility in product market, uh, uh, capital markets and the like. That efficient, that's effectively an efficiency agenda, which is absolutely important for the level of growth. Don't get me wrong, that is extremely important. It's a sine qua non mm -hmm. of getting the kind of living standards progress you want. But it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. It's necessary, but not sufficient. There are these, there's this ecosystem of other structural policy areas and institutions, such as the ones that Annabelle has mentioned, where, which influence the pattern of growth, mm -hmm. and thereby the extent to which the top line of a healthy growth rate translates into the bottom line expectation of society in terms of broad-based progress in median uh, living standards. And that's what this inclusive development uh, index and the underlying policy indicators, the cross-country data base that we put together enables countries to see. They can look across the 15 areas and see uh, how strong or weak they are relative to their peers yeah. in, the different, in four different income categories of countries around the world. And the idea is, okay, this is data. Every country is different, but you, at least you see the data where you are, you know, where you're healthy or relatively weak in this policy ecosystem. And if you want to construct an inclusive development strategy, this is a place to, to begin. And it operates on a different plane, really a more strategic plane than the typical political conversation we see play out in this region, for example, which is often growth versus redistribution of income. This is a different way of looking at it entirely, exactly. is that right? Well, that was exactly the point that I was going to make, that there's, you know, there's 
efficiency and uh, inclusiveness are not uh, exclusive. Right. Uh, I mean, they're, they're in that sense, you can have uh, efficiency with inclusion, and I think this is what the conversation is about. Because it's not, and you, you're right, that maybe in Latin America is one mm -hmm. region where this has played historically mm -hmm. as an either or. Um, and I think the question today, the, you know, the discussion today is about how do you have more efficiency and more inclusiveness at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so you can enter into this virtuous circle uh, that Rick was referring to. And I think that we see a number of countries in the region who are actually uh, going that way. You know, uh, when you know you come to a country like Argentina, and you see that there is a discussion, of course, associated with that growth mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, macro reforms and mm -hmm. the micro reforms, and that's very important. But you also see a very strong agenda, uh, you know, in areas as to how do you enhance the skills of the population, uh, how do you uh, update uh, the infrastructure, uh, how do you look at some of the uh, more, you know, typical social agenda uh, issues in a way that is more integrated uh, with the needs of having an economy that is much more competitive. Mm -hmm. So I think Latin America in that sense um, is, is, is moving from some of these discussions of the past that really, you know, didn't didn't really take the region uh, too far, uh, and coming into a more in a different sort of mindset with a different conversation that I think can be uh, much more productive in this region. It seems like a key to that we heard in some of the sessions yesterday a refrain around institutions, and we've just heard Rick pick this up again. So I wonder if either of you can talk a little bit about that, thinking about you know, government leaders, business leaders who are at a forum like this. What can they do? to strengthen the institutions in a direction that's aligned with this inclusive growth idea. Uh, can, can, you, can you talk a bit to that? Let me give you a few examples. So these 15 areas of institutional strength are areas where there is theoretically the win-win that Annabelle just referred to. Uh, in other words, if you, if you get your policy incentives right and you build robust institutional frameworks in these areas, it's both good for growth, the rate of growth, as well as for broad social participation in the process and benefits. Let me give you some examples, and we're sitting here in Argentina at the beginning of a remarkable uh, reform effort, and I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the, the extent of leadership that's being exercised here. But let, let's give you a few examples of what kinds mm -hmm. of institutional frameworks we're talking about here. Education. So Argentina actually has a rather good performance on educational access. Um, by, our, by our measure, a third out of 26 upper middle income countries in this regard. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's dead last in terms of educational equity. So education is one of the most important structural and institutional elements of a, of a strategy here. But it, most of the numbers, most of the, most of the attention usually is on enrollment in basic education mm -hmm. and, and, and tertiary and whatnot. But actually, if, if it's about inclusive growth, then what you have to look at is whether that educational access and quality is diffused widely across mm -hmm. the population. That's, that's one example. Second one, business and political ethics. A big issue around the continent and around much of the world. Uh, this is an area where, again, you have an absolute win-win for growth and equity if you improve the ethical environment on both the political and the business side. This country, uh, unfortunately, six 25th out of 26 by our data for upper middle income countries on measures and perceptions of business and political uh, ethics. A third area is on the financial side. And one of the one of the significant things I would note about our inclusive growth and development framework is that, yes, it looks at uh, some of the traditional areas of, of focus on inequality, like education and redistribution. On the other hand, there are other elements in this framework which are really about the business enabling environment, mm -hmm. and particularly the small scale business enabling environment, mm -hmm. the extent to which uh, uh, finance is intermediated from domestic savings into real economy investment. This is business language, right? And business language and business topics usually aren't included in, in discussions about social equity and inequality, but frankly, for that matter, corruption and, and ethics. Okay. But these are fundamental elements 
of what you need as a balanced and comprehensive strategy on inclusive growth. And here, too, as the government has properly uh, recognized, that uh, the financial intermediation of real economy investment here is not functioning as well as it could be. They are, again, dead last, 26 out of 26 upper middle income countries uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. So these are some of the examples of institutional and structural areas of policy where you can get win-wins. And indeed, if you look at the, uh, the Argentinian government's uh, reform strategy, they are absolutely targeting a number of these uh, areas. And I think it shows the power of an index, right, to be able to look at that and have that discussion and say, here's where my country is and, and this is where I want to go. Sorry, Annabelle. One, one uh, important point that I wanted to make is that we have been discussing here about the role of uh, policies, and that's absolutely very important. But there's also the another um, uh, angle to it is the role of the private sector mm -hmm. uh, and private sector practices uh, that foster inclusive growth. Uh, so this is an area where both uh, the, the forum uh, and us, with the support of the government of uh, Canada and Germany, launched a call for proposals mm -hmm. uh, to um, learn about business practices that foster inclusive growth. And uh, actually, uh, we received a, a, a good number of very interesting cases mm. uh, that we are evaluating uh, right now. And, you know, we have cases, for instance, uh, of a company, uh, Millflower. Um, these are three college graduates uh, who worked on um, uh, a nutritious, like a super nutritious uh, food uh, that can be used for addressing uh, tackling malnutrition. This has was developed in uh, Guatemala. Uh, mm. This is a very interesting uh, case mm. about how can and you come together with business models uh, that at the same time they are successful, um, uh, they generate growth, but at the same time they're also serving a very important uh, social purpose. So again, and uh, you know, partnering, um, you know, institutions that have similar visions uh, to try to promote this new idea that is not about choosing between you know efficiency and inclusiveness, but rather how to bring them together, both at the policy level and also at the uh, private sector level. Great, thank you for that. We we have time, I think, for two quick questions. Uh, if we have any from the floor, I think there's a microphone perhaps that will come around to you. Here we go. We've got one in the front and another one here. I just ask if you can give us your name and your organization and try to keep it uh, as brief as you can, please. Sure. Um, hi, my name's David Head. I'm with Alex Partners. Um, a quick question, really, and is I wonder whether you've considered redefining what a job is at any point in this analysis. Because I think that we talk about jobs and productivity, but that's with a ancient frame of reference. You know, I get up in the morning, I clock in at 8 o'clock, I do a 40-hour week like my father did and his father and his father. And I think that's an antiquated frame of reference now. And when we talk about productivity of a person, it needs to be more than this. What do you do for the society in which you live? And how can we value that and let the people know that are doing things other than a standard job that is valued and we can reward it in some way other than wages? Interesting. Thank you. And a question over here, if we can bring the mic over. We're going we're gonna to do, we're gonna do both at the same time, and then we'll, we'll tackle them. Good luck them. with this. Uh, two days I haven't heard the word church or organized religion mentioned. Okay. As an outsider, it, it's like a big elephant in the room. What's their role? What are the problems? I don't know if we're in Chatham House rules or not, but I'd love a candid response. And sorry, name and organization. And Eisenberg. Various. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got a question from David um, about uh, is are we thinking about jobs in the right frame here too? Is that another area like GDP that we've got to change the way we, we look at it? Uh, and a question from Daniel about organized religion, the role of faith communities, and are, are they part of this discussion in some way or should they be? He, he, said he hasn't heard it so far at the forum. Either of you want to pick up on, on either of those points, and we're getting sort of to wrapping up, so you can include some wrap-up comments as well, if you, if you don't mind. Well, let me just briefly say that uh, jobs continue to be the most important, uh, the most important uh, instrument uh, for people to uh, uh, come out of poverty, because what, you know, Poor people have is basically mm -hmm. uh, their own uh, their own uh, uh, labor. So uh, that doesn't mean that the nature of jobs are not changing. Uh, but uh, and I think that this is a question that probably would motivate a long uh, a long answer uh, that uh, we can probably take offline. But it's to say that I uh, you know still creating jobs continues to be uh, the most important way of coming out of poverty in many in many places. 
Maybe two quick thoughts. One is uh, the, the issue you're raising, the changing nature of work, is is quite fundamental to this body of work. You know. Again, the, the traditional way of reformers have looked at labor market issues has been about flexibility. But in fact, uh, if you're interested in inclusive growth and living standards as opposed to just top-line growth, if you will, you're really interested in the fact that in many countries over the past several years, a third or more of the work that's been created is what they call non-standard work, not the full-time salaried arrangement with uh, benefits that come with it, but rather it's temporary or independent contract or other type of uh, more flexible work, sometimes stacked up in, in multiples, as you're suggesting, different. Uh, unfortunately, for, for many countries, if not most, the, um, the framework for benefits and taxation and the like uh, is basically oriented toward the traditional uh, model of full-time salary arrangements. And in a world where the nature of work is shifting, it's, it's out of sync. And that is contributing, frankly, to the problem of, of stagnating living standards or underperforming living standards, if you will. So I, I completely agree with you, and we, we address some of that uh, in this report, and we're going to do some follow-on work in that area. On the interesting question of religion, I, I, would, uh, I, I would argue that uh, while maybe you didn't hear about it here generally, on this topic, um, religion and, and organized religion is actually having a significant effect. And we're here in, in South America where the Catholic Church is quite important. And uh, the Pope has really provided a degree of uh, energy, if you will, to this discussion about social equity and growth and what is an economy for in a way that I have not seen come from almost any institution of society. And in fact, this work began, uh, it had its first public light of day in the Vatican. Uh, where we hadn't yet released it, but we wanted to test it a little bit. And we, so we did, with the Vatican, we did a co-convening uh, of a multi-stakeholder community and some of the religious community there. And I believe that this notion of shifting the, what economists would call the policy anchor, or the North Star, the, you know, the compass setting from uh, growth, still absolutely vital, but to something that's more meaningful for human beings, which is broad-based, progress and living standards is essentially also, it's, it makes good sense economically, but it's also just right. It's, it's morally the right, the right way we should have our minds think about uh, economic progress. And I, I personally believe, as somebody who works in this field, that the, uh, the influence of the religious community, not only, but maybe most dramatically in the form of the Catholic Church and the, and the current pope, is really an important force for progress in this area. Well, thank you. With that, uh, we need to wrap up our session. Uh, I'll just say I think this is an important moment, hopefully one that we all will look back on and remember for Argentina, certainly, but really for the whole region and for the world. This is a moment where we need to get this right. Shifting this kind of mental framework from GDP to IDI is not an easy thing, but if we don't figure out how to make all people and all societies part of the amazing potential that you see at a forum like this, when you think about the technological innovations that are coming, the new models for growth that are out there, but making sure everyone is a part of that is absolutely critical. So I hope we walk away remembering IDI, get the old GDP model, well, it's important, but for the side and remember, inclusive development is really the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.